national security officials said those tax gave Moscow access to the control systems that run some U.S. utilities and factories. Russia also targeted U.S. nuclear facilities for cyber attacks. That was in Friday's Wall Street Journal. In the New York Post, my favorite newspaper, <laughs> at the bottom of an article saying, Kremlin wrapped for viral havoc. Maersk, a Danish shipping giant, lost $300 million around ports uh, after ports around the world were shut down by the attack from a Russian cyber attack. Its chairman, uh, Jim Snobby, said the company had to buy 4,000 new servers, 4,500 new PCs, and 2,500 applications as a result of the attacks. The third happened to come from uh, the AFIO publication called Weekly Intelligent News. Digital intelligence biggest threat to Norway, according to the spy agency. Norway's Foreign Intelligence Service has named digital intelligence as the top threat to the Nordic country, a public broadcaster NRK reported Monday. Various subjects try to compromise and infiltrate Norwegian authorities and business, the Norwegian Intelligence Service said in its annual threat assessment. Academia, power and telecom companies, and state institutions are exposed to persistent foreign intelligence activities whose purpose is primarily to obtain information about traditional pol political and military goals and secondly, secondly industrial espionage. So here, here are just three uh, items at random. A and these are all provoked, I think, by the poisoning of the former uh, Soviet colonel who had been working with the British and who was poisoned about 10 days ago by, uh, by the Russians. Um, Sergei Skripal, I think that has provoked a, an enormous response, certainly from this country. Uh, apparently the UK, France, United States have joined in condemning this. And for the first time, the United States has uh, provided information about these attacks which had hitherto been kept secret. I, d I didn't know about it, maybe perhaps some of you did. But these are, these are really serious issues. And when you think about closing down our grid, uh, a former director, Jim Woolsey, has been writing many, many articles in the New York Times about the danger from North Korea and Iran. For example, Iran having a nuclear weapon, bringing it uh, in a freighter into the Caribbean, and exploding it over the United States. It could knock out every, every generator in the United States. Now this is, this is really serious. So the Russians uh, have provoked with the poisoning of uh, Mr. Skripal a reaction which I hope uh, gets everybody's attention because these attacks have been going on for a long time. They have not been widely broad publicized in this country, which I think is a mistake and the private sector, uh, our national government has been the, the top, uh, been the subject of these attacks for a long time. Uh, I heard a, a wonderful lecture last week in New York at the Carnegie Council by somebody called Robert Kaplan. He is a strategic thinker, and he was talking about China, and he said, I quote, we are at war with China. China, as many of you know, I'm sure, uh, has been taking Atolls from the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea, building airports, building uh, naval facilities, putting aircraft on them, all of which uh, also um, claimed by the Philippines, and incrementally establishing a present, not doing any one thing which would provoke any kind of a military response, but through a series of, of uh, these islands has now a uh, a presence, a military presence in the South China Seas. Uh, this has been uh, condemned by the International Court of Justice in, in 2016, and the Chinese uh, said it's not true, it still belongs to us. So you have a lot of competing uh, interests in, in that area. So that's just by, just by way of beginning. Don't mean to put a pall on the discussion, but uh, there are some really serious issues out there. Now I'm going to go to my to my my normal my normal talk, which is uh, divided into three parts. I'm going to add a fourth. 
The first is I'm going to talk about a, a major, uh, very complex and continuing operation against the United States to steal commercial secrets by, uh, by a supposed ally of ours. It's been going on for 30 years. The second, second portion will involve anecdotes uh, from the Cold War, from uh, operations overseas, what actually happens overseas when somebody walks in with uh, two bags full of uh, top secret documents, uh, five or six of those. I'm going to talk about uh, Somalia for a little bit, where I spent two very, very interesting years. Where for the two years it only rained for five hours. <laughs> July of 1974, one day it rained three hours and the next day two. That was the total of the rainfall in Somalia, which had at that time a per capita income of about $35 a year. So you wonder where the pirates came from. The pirates came from that abject poverty and uh, uh, a country that has no resources, no oil, no water most of the time, and uh, three times the size of France. Very interesting country, but more about that later. Okay, um, this effort, this 30-year-old effort of industrial espionage against the United States was initiated by France. 1958, General de Gaulle comes back into power and he knows his country economically is still suffering from the war, particularly in the North, and he calls in his intelligence chief and he says, I want to operate all azimuth, which basically meant operating against the United States. They had been concerned about the Soviets uh, invading Western Europe, but de Gaulle reasoned the United States is in Germany with uh, major forces and we are safe here uh, to the West. So that began a, a program which came to be known as BAG operations. If you represent IBM, United Technology, Boeing, Big Target, almost any large com uh, com company, excuse me, uh, where your information, your, at that time we were really the only game of town, particularly in technology. And the French wanted to catch up. They wanted to increase their economic competitiveness. So if you were one of these businessmen traveling in Europe, uh, traveling in Paris or the Côte d'Azur, which is their Silicon Valley, uh, and you come in for dinner, you leave your briefcase in your hotel room, you go out, and because it's a nuisance to carry a briefcase, the French service began coming in 10 to 15 times a day. Imagine, photographing all the documents, taking them back to their headquarters, and then turning it over to the comp company which is in competition with, say, IBM would be Machine Ball. This went on for 30 years. Imagine, 30 years, France. So. Um, the reason we found out about this is that you may recall in 1985 the test ban, the final test ban was going into effect and the French were conducting a series of nuclear tests down in the, uh, in the South Pacific. And Greenpeace was protesting these tests. So they were sending up boats by day, a boat by day, a chartered boat called the Rainbow Warrior from Auckland, New Zealand. They'd go up by day and harass, harass the French naval vessels, and the French Minister of Defense, Mr. Ernu, got really upset. So he sent down a team of six people, five men and one woman, frogmen. I don't know what you call a woman who's trained in, in uh, those arts, but we'll call her frog woman for the moment. Anyway, they went down, they got a zodiac, and they put two limpets at night in Auckland Harbor on the Rainbow War and sank the ship. Uh, a Portuguese photographer who had been with Greenpeace going up by day uh, got out of the ship and then he went back to rescue his very expensive Hasselblad equipment and he went down to the ship, died. So uh, this was a big flap between the French and New Zealanders. You think of it, uh, New Zealand, a Western country, not necessarily geographically, but certain in orientation, um, being targeted by, by the French government. So they have talk shows in Paris. And a gentleman called Pierre Payon, who has written this book called Secret d'État, 
uh, was on the panel, and he was asked, can't the French service do anything right? And he says, ah oui, ils ont des opérations de valise. You have these bag operations. And so he proceeds to describe on national tele television <laughs> that 10 to 15 times a day, I have the, I have the transcript here, if anybody disbelieves me, about how they go into the uh, into these briefcases and, and steal all this stuff, 10 to 15 times a day in the major hotels in Paris and down in the Côte d'Azur. Now, he didn't say so then, but they also were getting into our diplomatic pouches. They had gypsies out at Charles de Gaulle Airport that if you're standing at the counter uh, processing your ticket, these kids come up and take your briefcase. And the commander of the Sixth Fleet from Naples lost his briefcase that way at Charles de Gaulle Airport. So this was a multifaceted uh, effort against uh, basically the Americans. Now, when we found this out, we went to work, we got lucky, and began to get into the, the real nuts and bolts of this program. It turned out that they had a woman in the travel section in the American embassy. In the big embassies, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, there's a travel section that keeps track of all the VIPs that come in from Washington, from the State Department, Defense, uh, Federal Reserve, uh, Alan Greenspan's people were regularly targeted. And the travel section prepares a, uh, just a, a list of all the visitors coming in each week with the hotel they're staying at, the control officer, and so, uh, this woman, Maria Lamont, who had been working for the French since uh, a tour with the American Embassy in Phnom Penh in 1966, all that time, uh, would have a meeting with their case officer Friday night and give him this document from which they could target where they're going to put their effort into in the next week. So uh, I was in Paris from 84 to... Uh, uh, 80, 83 to, eight, uh, to 88, when I came back, uh, managed to get enough interest at headquarters to go down and talk to the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and to take some action. So we sent a retired General Walters, Bernard Walters, who had been in Paris uh, in the 1970s during the Paris peace talks, who knew Mitterrand and Jacques Chirac personally, and uh, he went to them and said, this has got to stop. And they said, Vous parlez chinois, like I have no idea what you're talking about. You're speaking Chinese, uh, but of course they did know. And the the interesting thing is, of course, that it did stop for about three months. But but their industrial, their companies uh, began to look for this more information. They didn't want not to have what was coming to them free uh, from the French government. So it started up again, and I'm sure to this day. Uh, people who travel to Paris with not only documents but with, uh, with computers are subject to loss. It's just, uh, it's just what happened. But France was the first country with an effort like this supported by the government. You have industrial espionage among companies that's been going on for years and years and years. But France was the first one to, to really take it to a, a much higher level. And since then, of course, the Japanese have been involved in this, the Chinese, almost every country you can think of is trying to steal secrets where they think uh, the country has the technological edge. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about some uh, operational anecdotes from the field. Uh, there are many ways that, that we gather intelligence and one of the the best ways, really, is to, uh, to be on the receiving end of somebody who walks in with uh, a couple of briefcases full of top secret documents. So that happened uh, in Italy in 1966. I was on my first tour, and we got a call from the, uh, the consul in Trieste, and he said, there's a Czech general here who wants to defect the United States, and he's got two bags of what he says are top secret Warsaw Pact documents. Uh, he was with somebody he called his cousin. It was a 26-year-old girl who turned out to be his girlfriend. He was about 40. So the two of them drove down under with an escort uh, of ours to Rome. We brought out a Czech speaker. Uh, indeed, his 
documents were authentic and legitimate, and we brought it back to the United States under something called Public Law 110, which authorizes CIA to bring in people of exceptional intelligence value. That was the first one. Uh, another one, Nicosia 1987. Uh, a Palestinian walks in, says he wants to speak to somebody who has security responsibilities, sort of a euphemism for our people. We had a, a female officer, excellent Arabic speaker, who went down to speak to him. And he said, uh, I have two hours. Uh, I will agree to be debriefed for $3,000. Two hours, $3,000. So um, we did a quick trace. We knew who he was. Uh, he'd been part of a group that had been involved in bombings in Paris in 1986. I don't know if anybody you remember, but in 1986 was not a good year to travel to France because there were bombings going on by this, uh, by this small uh, group in the Beka Valley. So uh, again, um, uh, serendipitous situation where somebody needs money, they're tired of being a, a terrorist or whatever it is, they, and they see an American embassy and they know, that they, excuse me, they know that what they have is valuable and uh, they're willing to give up some time, take some risks, and uh, pass it over. Uh, I want to add that uh, during the Clinton years, uh, when John Deutsch was director, um, the agency decided under pressure from, from the uh, Senate Committee, Intelligence Committee, that uh, it was a time when human rights uh, had become a, a big issue politically. And so the rule was you cannot talk to a walk-in unless he has assured you that he has not violated anybody's human rights. <laughs> now think of it. <laughs> the people that we would like to talk to <laughs> do not have clean hands, and, and, and in many cases, they have killed. But for a period of time, or for a period of about a year, when you had a walk-in like that, you had to send a cable to headquarters. Somebody had to run John down John Deutsch. Most of the time, uh, it was in the evening, and he's out somewhere, so you got to get the security guys to get his attention, to take a memorandum to him and to have him say, oh, okay, we can, we can do this, uh, even though he's, you know, he's, not, he's not, uh, not guilty of violating someone here. I mean, this is, you know, this is a, just a personal opinion and an absurdity the way uh, some of these things uh, happen. If you don't get walk-ins who've done some things, then you're not going to get a lot of information. Uh, another walk-in a little bit, a little bit different, occurred in Oslo, 1976. Uh, I have the duty Saturday morning and I get a call from the local police. Uh, the special police there have uh, internal security uh, responsibilities like the FBI does. And they said, please come down to our headquarters. So I went down and there is a young North Korean uh, diplomat, about 25 years old, covered in blood from head to toe. So what did he do? He came in 15 minutes late uh, Saturday morning, and the deputy chief of mission, who was a colonel in the North Korean army, just beat him up, said, you're not here on time, and um, so broke his nose, and uh, he was really a mess. He didn't speak, he spoke enough English to get, get the word across. So when the colonel went out for coffee, uh, this young man picked up his coat and went down to the local police station said, I want out, I want to go to the United States. So we brought a Korean, ethnic Korean, an officer of ours, out. We spent uh, a couple hours with him. He was who he said he was. He was not of exceptional value, but he was of sufficient value because we don't get a lot of North Koreans to bring in, again, under public law 110. Somalia. Somalia is, uh, this is just an anecdote. Uh, Somalia is a, is a really interesting place, and one of the jobs, we had a very, very small embassy, we really had three substantive officers. When we had an ambassador, which was about a third of the time, uh, and then we would have a deputy chief of mission who was the charge the rest of the time. We had a political officer who was there about half the time. Uh, he was Jewish. The State Department made a big mistake sending him out there to a Muslim country because he is scared to death that there's going to be 
uh, some kind of attack on him. Uh, this is 1973. In the spring of 1973, uh, Black September, which was an offshoot of the PLO, had conducted an operation against the Saudi embassy in Khartoum, and a couple of people were killed, including an American. So there was a lot of terrorism and concern about terrorism in, in Somalia at that time. So um, one of the jobs I had was my cover was uh, uh, the consul. I was the US consul. I was the commercial attache. And because I had a couple kids, I was also made uh, chairman of the school board. Now, the school in many places like that uh, has been, is an American school built by State Department funds. I mean, all over Africa this occurred. And we had 43 nationalities, 120 students. Very interesting group, and most of them didn't speak English, so English was a big part of our, of our program. Uh, but one day, the principal called me and said, uh, this particular ambassador has not paid his bill. Will you go around and see him? So I called him up, and I said who I was. And uh, so I went around to see him, and uh, I walked in, and he gave me uh, an envelope with a check in it, like he knew exactly what it was. And he said, uh, he said, Mr. Hunt, I've been trying to find a way to get to you, to talk to you, without it being obvious to the security service. So I said, your son is going to have a lot of problems. We're going to have to talk about him a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I began a dialogue with, with this gentleman. And uh, it turned out to be a very valuable source. He had very good, uh, very good uh, sources in the, in the Somali government at that time. Uh, Somalia was not, uh, it was like a denied area, like, like the Soviet Union, where the locals were not permitted to meet with foreigners. Just you're not supposed to have any contact at all. Somalis could not come to our house, to my house. And uh, it was just, just a way of preventing security problems from, from their point of view. The, um, Another thing that, that happened there is that uh, I began working with a, a young Arab who eventually became a, a source. And uh, I said to him one time, I said, what is it that, that um, has brought you to work with the United States? And he said, well, there are the obvious reasons. I don't like what's happening in my country, and I understand the Cold War, and the United States is the country that represents uh, freedom. Uh, very sincere about that. But he said, I've also read Jack London. And he said, any country, and I get this, any country that produces an author like Jack London is worthy of associating with. <laughs> now, you know, you couldn't make it up. You, you could not make that up. So the, um, <laughs> I'll tell you just one or two. Two other little anecdotes from, uh, from Somalia. Um, I was invited one evening to a dinner party uh, hosted by the Syrian ambassador. And there were only two Westerners there, myself and a young French diplomat called Jean-Francois Philibert. Philibert was a small man, about 5'5", five, five, curly, curly hair, very intellectual looking, rimmed glasses, uh, very easy smile, married to a Vietnamese woman. And so we go. I, I had no idea who was going to be there. And uh, so it's the Syrian ambassador, the Libyan charge, the Iranian, and the Iraqi. So there are four, four, and two. There are only two of us on the Western side. And when we get there, I noticed all the, the Arabs and the Iranian are drinking scotch neat. Now, any idea you may have that that Islamic practice forbids diplomats from drinking wrong. <laughs> the Libyan, who happened to be a, a casual contact of mine, would come to my house. And after the first time, when he saw where the liquor closet was, he would walk in, he'd fill a tumbler of scotch neat, and he'd drink it just like that. And then he'd fill it again, and he'd start to talk. <laughs> but anyway, back to dinner. So we go into the dinner, and it's about a, probably 90 degrees. The temperature in Somalia never went, in Mogadishu, never went below 80. 
and the humidity is about 95, 98% all over. So it is really warm. There's no AC. So there's a fan going sort of lazily around, and there are a few flies around, and we have the traditional dish, couscous. So uh, <laughs> after about, I don't know, 20 minutes, the Syrian ambassador starts to attack the Frenchman for French colonial practices and how bad the French were as colonists. And he started in, in, uh, in Indochina, uh, Vietnam, Cochin, China. Then he moved down to Syria, Lebanon. Then he went to North Africa. And he's saying, you know, how the French mistreated the locals, how they, they stole the resources, uh, raped the women, and treated everybody very badly, never allowed to, to arise to uh, above a certain level, civil service level, like the Japanese did the Koreans from 1908 until 1945. And uh, Philippe Bear is very smart. He's not saying a word, but it's getting really vicious. And then the, the Libyan chimes in and starts talking about the Italians and Tripoli and how they treated the, the locals. And the Iraqi chimes in, he's talking about the British, and it goes on and on. And finally, I said, Your Excellency, is this an example of Arab hospitality? <laughs> well, it stopped. The point, the point is, and I, and I sent a cable to headquarters the next day, the point is that this, uh, this distrust of the, of the British and the French, the hatred of the British and the French, is in the DNA of a certain uh, generation of Arab leaders, because they saw it. And however the actions of the French and the British were actually were, what they took away from it was really a deep resentment. So when you see pictures of people like in the Arab Spring in Cairo, uh, you know, raising their fists and, and visibly anger against whatever it is, you know that in their own feelings that they have this, they have this real hatred of the West. And I think that's something that has, uh, permeated their younger people, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's just something to keep in mind when, you, when you're dealing with, with that part of the world. I'm going to talk a little bit now, uh, one last anecdote from, from Somalia. Um, I had to go up and do a consular interview in my capacity as the U.S. consul up in Hargeza, which was the capital of, of uh, British Somaliland at that time. And so I went up there, I put in for permission to travel. You, had to, you couldn't just go, you had to tell the farm ministry that you wanted to go up to uh, Hargeza and what the reason was. So I, I said what the reason was. So I get in the, Somali Airlines had two leased Boeing 707s. So I got in and there are only three of us in the passenger, myself and two surveillance from the Somali Security Service which I might add was uh, advised by the East German service, which was really an excellent service. Um, so we go up there, they follow me, I go to something called the Hargeza Club, which was this uh, absolutely dilapidated British colonial club at one time. I mean, it was just, just a mess. And I have my interview with this Pakistani doctor and he's fully qualified, that goes fine. And then he takes me to the hospital where he has been uh, practicing. And uh, I go back to the aircraft. And the uh, two Somalis are with me all the time. They go to the back. And I see, I see, look like a Westerner sitting up towards the front of the plane. So I go up and sit down next to him. Uh, I mean, our stock and trade is people, right? So it's not very often you would find, I mean, that's the first time I'd been up there. So here is this Italian, and he's an engineer. And he is working on a refurbishing of the port of Berbera. Berbera had been visited a year earlier by the Soviet Admiral Gorshkov, head of the Soviet Navy. Now, you know, Somalia, the temperature up there is about 130 degrees. He spent two days there. So I wrote a note to headquarters. I said, this is very significant. Something's going to happen in Berbera. <coughs> And my ambassador, who fancied himself a, a Soviet expert, disagreed. He said, it doesn't mean a thing. You can't really take that from this. 
Well, anyway, I sit with this Italian engineer, and he's the only Westerner supervising uh, Soviets and Somalis building an enormously long runway and fort facility. So I send a cable to headquarters about four or five intel reports. And what I didn't know at the time was that Henry Kissinger was looking for justification to get the Congress to authorize the United States to take over Diego Garcia, which was a British-held island in the Indian Ocean where there was an air base. And Kissinger is looking ahead. I guess he's imagining that we might be involved in Afghanistan or Iraq at some point. He was certainly ahead of his time. So the State Department does something very smart. They call in the Somali ambassador, who was a hapless individual called Adu. He had not been home for years. He was just sitting in Washington, was not in touch. And the State Department officer says to him, Ambassador Adu, we understand there's a lot of Soviet activity going on up at Berber. He said, oh no, that can't be, that can't be. He said, why don't you come out and see? Big mistake. So the State Department puts together a delegation. They find a congressman with an engineering background and they give him a staff which is all composed of military U.S. Army experts in missile technology, weapons, uh, cranes, the kind of thing that move heavy missiles around. And they go out, they come out to Mogadishu Henry Kissinger authorized a U-2 overflight of Berbera. We had U-2 stationed in Egypt. And so when this, this group arrived, I took them up to the roof of the embassy because there were locals in the embassy you couldn't see, and showed them a layout of Berbera. So they were going to go up there with the Somali Minister of Defense who was going to accompany them and actually inspect the facilities. There was a big hangar there, and nobody knew what was in this hangar. So I briefed them. I said, they're going to give you a lot of tea. You're going to have to make a call of nature. You're going to be embarrassed to make a call of nature in the bush. You know, you, it's, you know you've been in Washington for a long time. You're not used to doing that. And they're going to try to shorten the visit which is what happened. But they did get there. They did go to the hangar, and there's a barbed wire fence around. A Soviet soldier would not let them in. This is the Somali Minister of Defense now. And so eventually, after words, uh, a, so a Soviet officer comes out and lets them in. They go into the, into the hangar, and there is a crane designed to handle the SA-2 missile. There was only one other outside the Soviet Union, and that was in Cuba never used because of the Cuban Missile Crisis. But uh, there it was. So this was sufficient uh, justification for Henry Kissinger to get authorization to build the, an American, essentially American base on Diego Garcia. So my only point is that the serendipity uh, makes a big difference in intelligence work. There's a story that Alan Dulles used to say, tell on himself, when he was the consul in Bern in 1917, he'd only been there a few months, he got a call from Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, who was about to go back into, into Russia. And it was a Friday afternoon, and Dulles said, I, I can't meet with you. He was playing tennis Saturday morning. So he missed the only opportunity for an American to meet the man who basically took over, the, took over Russia with the Bolshevik Revolution. So, you know, I used to say, and I, I hope it still happens, that when you're overseas and you get an invitation somewhere, always go. You never know who you're going to meet. <laughs> Seriously. And, and even if it's not somebody of operational interest, you sit down to somebody at dinner, you ask them what they do. You improve your own knowledge of that country. It allows you to better understand the locals, what, what, what they worry about, what is concerned, uh, concerning to them, what is the risk to them. In France, for example, um, coming out of the war, the DST, the, the local internal security service, cooperated with the Nazis. They were the ones that, were, that uh, rounded up all the Jews. So even in the 80s when I was there, they were not well regarded by particularly the older generation because they had collaborated with the Nazis. So that was very important to know. 
So you could make a pitch, you could make an approach to a, to a Frenchman and be pretty sure that it would not be reported if it was not accepted. So this is the kind of thing that, uh, that is, is so important in our work. So one man uh, just happened to get lucky, but I'm sure that in stations around the world now, these kinds of uh, contacts are going. And uh, there are still walk-ins. It's harder to take a walk-in today because the security around American embassies uh, is so tight. So you have to find other ways to get to our people. Let me comment in closing uh, about uh, Gina Haspel, Mike Pompeo. Uh, Gina Haspel became deputy director of the agency in January of last year, uh, just about the time that uh, Trump was inaugurated. And she is a highly re regarded officer, uh, came into the agency in 1985, uh, I never knew her, I never knew of her, but I've heard nothing but good things about her. And last year she gave a talk to the, uh, to the group called the uh, Central Intelligence Retire Retirement uh, Retirees. And uh, she said there are four things that, that we are emphasizing now as we go forward. First of all, uh, back to basics. We're an espionage organization. And during the Obama years, uh, at uh, emphasis on human source intelligence dropped way off, even to the point that in Europe I was told they weren't running unilateral operations, just working with liaison. That's not good enough. We have to do better than that. The second point is um, focus field forward. Put more people in the field. There was also a tendency to grow the headquarters compound and uh, less less interest, again, in collecting uh, information overseas. So that has been reversed. And it'll be very interesting to see uh, under Rex Tillerson, a lot of the State Department uh, positions were unfilled. There was pressure to reduce the overseas presence. And I hope now that uh, with Mike Pompeo, uh, whom I'm sure will be confirmed, that this, uh, this trend could stop. And, and uh, because if state cuts their number of slots overseas, we have to take a few cuts too, and we need as many people as possible. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, thirdly, uh, language. It's, it's always a problem to find officers who are willing to take a year and study uh, an obscure language. Uh, it's, just, it's, a, it's just a hard thing to do, and uh, it's been a continual problem for us from the beginning. That's why we're hiring more and more uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic um, people with an ethnic background who have those languages uh, as their own as their own language, and then lastly, to leverage relationships uh, in Washington with state, with the Department of Defense, uh, particularly those two. Department of Defense is is always trying to take over the primary position of of human source intelligence overseas, and so far we have managed to hold them up. We, Station Chief, is the arbiter and uh, approver of all operations in his particular country. Uh, if, if, if DIA wants to run an operation there, it has to have the approval of, uh, of our station. Uh, similarly, uh, I was up, as I said, I was up in Maine the other day. Uh, somebody asked me uh, about service in New York. I said, yes, we have a station in New York. Uh, our station in New York is, is work is directed towards the foreign community uh, in New York City. There's a large, of course, UN uh, contingent. There's a lot of, a lot of economic activities, uh, economic targets in New York City. But nothing we do in the United States is done without specific approval of the FBI. Uh, we're not a law enforcement agency. We don't carry guns. And uh, it, uh, it, works, it works well. I'm going to add one final comment. Uh, about the FBI, and I think everybody here who's been following the situation with Nicholas Cruz uh, in Florida uh, is appalled that the number of calls that were made not only to the local police but to the FBI and, and nothing, nothing was done. Uh, one of the reasons is that the FBI is a law enforcement agency. They prosecute, and unless they think that they can get a prosecution, they're not always likely to pick up the case. We are an intelligence agency. It's a very, very different kind of thing. And there were, 
uh, uh, cases uh, in New York that, uh, that I was aware of, I used to meet with the FBI once a month, and uh, they, had, they had under surveillance a group of Muslims who had a, rented a farm in Pennsylvania and were carrying out live fire exercises on the weekend. And I said, why don't you do something about this? He said, well, we don't know. They haven't done anything wrong yet. Uh, when I was in Maine on Saturday, somebody from the audience who had been with the agency said that he had done a rotational tour at the FBI at that time, and headquarters got so upset that the local field office in New York City, consisting of over 1,000 agents, had not done something about it, that they took the case over themselves. So there's a lot of culture in, in how they operate. You may remember the Sarnoff brothers, the two that uh, had, the, had the big bomb at the Boston Olympics uh, marathon. Well, uh, the FBI had been tipped off by the Russians that these people had undergone some terrorist training in one of the stands. I can't remember which one it was. So two FBI agents went out to talk to the two Sarnoff brothers. And about 15 minutes into the interview, one of the FBI agents says, are you a terrorist? <laughs> oh, no, I kid you not. And the fellow said, no, case closed. I'm uh, serious. I mean, it sort of mind boggles the mind that, that this could happen and that there isn't some lingering feeling in the back of these people that can be brought into their culture to do more, to be more proactive than to just wait until some terrible thing happens. Uh, my last comment is to put in a plug for a, uh, an agency officer turned author, Jason Matthews. Uh, have any of you seen or heard of Red Sparrow? Well, it's a movie that just came out on, the, on, on I think, the first of the month. Uh, Jason Matthews had about 30 years in CIA, and uh, he's written three excellent novels. And if you're interested in a really good read and apparently a great movie, I recommend Jason Matthews, his Red Sparrow, uh, Palace, of, uh, Palace of Treason, and Kremlin Candidate. That's the most recent one, obviously based on last year's election. So with that, I will close and take questions on anything that you might have. OK, give me just a moment, and I'll come in and come around with the microphone. I'm coming right behind you, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sure that we have uh, excellent cyber capability. Have we made it known to our adversaries that there are consequences if they use their cyber capability to attack us? I certainly hope so. Uh, and, and to give an indication of at least one aspect of our cyber capability, uh, I went to a lecture in New York about a year and a half ago given by a three-star Air Force General, uh, Bender. He has three directorates under his control, all having to do with cyber warfare. He has 55,000 people and a budget of 17 million billion, billion dollars. Now, he didn't say anything hardly during his briefing because it's all highly <laughs> classified. But just to look at the numbers, you have to think that we're doing something. Uh, I know that there have been some discussions, informal discussions, uh, with, the, with, the, with the Russians. Uh, apparently, they have not taken. I mean, the, the, the danger of cyber warfare is you don't know where it's going to end. You have these people testing our own capabilities. But supposing they actually take down some of our facilities, and we do the same to them. So where, where does it end? With the, with the, with the atomic bomb, and mutual assured destruction, you know, there was certainly a limit. You're not going to do that because if you do, you're going to be blown off the face of the earth. But with cyber warfare, it, it's so, so much that's uh, fluid, you, you can't really tell. You talked a little bit about the. Uh, start this off with about what the French did in, in their work and, and understanding our industrial uh, prowess in different matters. 
What does the CIA do for the companies like General Electric and Boeing that <coughs> try to meet quarterly numbers and things like that in selling to China so we transfer technology to China legally on an ongoing basis if it, uh, we, Boeing has a separate black box company for their airplanes and they say, well, okay, that technology can't go. But the, but much of the technology is shared between the civilian side and the, and the black box side. Same thing happens in GE or, or a number of these. Does CIA get involved in checking what we transfer? We never used to. Um, I suppose it happens that because there, there's a committee in the Department of Defense that has to uh, pass on all this transfer, and they've been very, very, uh, I think, lenient because Boeing's had joint projects with the Chinese, and uh, the Chinese are building their own aircraft. I mean, they have a long way to go before they'll be competing with, with any of, of either Airbus or, or uh, Boeing. But, uh, but yes, they're, they're, they're stealing a lot. There's no question about it. And uh, this, is the, this is a big problem. It's a big counterintelligence problem. But CIA, uh, it may be that uh, we're asked to give a, uh, an opinion, but uh, certainly not during the time I was there. And people say, well, the, the French help their own industry. Don't we help our industry? No, we do not. It has used to come up periodically. Uh, why should we not help, or companies would come to us and say, why don't you help us? Well, first of all, you have foreign ownership now of Mary of many companies. So how do you decide how you're going to give what to who? If you give something to GM, you have to do it to Ford and Chrysler. I mean, it just, so the answer always was, after this was looked at sort of every 10 years, no, we're not going to give any help to, uh, to our own industry. We just shouldn't do that. OK, I'm coming back up front. While there has always been criticism, constructive criticism, of our intelligence bureaus, the FBI and the CIA, the last year under the Trump administration has seen a barrage of ongoing comments made that have been deplorable against our intelligence agencies. In your estimation, what is the short-term and long-term effect of this ongoing criticism about both the CIA and the FBI and how they are carrying out their duties? Uh, actually, uh, the president, except for um, comments that were taken out of context the first day he was in office, practically went out to headquarters. And uh, what was reported in the press did not actually occur. He was very complimentary of the agency. He took note of the stars on the wall of the agency officers that had been killed. And since then, uh, his criticism of the agency has been pretty mute. He gets along very well with Mike Pompeo. And uh, I, I think we basically have been, been spared the kind of um, criticism that has been leveled at the FBI. And I think the FBI uh, it's a very different situation. I think there were some irregularities there, certainly with the, uh, the FISA doctrine, with the FISA a warrant. When I was at CIA, if you wanted to get uh, a, a warrant or you wanted to get NSA to do something for you, you had to, you had to explain absolutely everything. And even then, it wasn't a sure thing. And I think, I think in the last years, frankly, this whole process has kind of deteriorated. Uh, because for the FBI to be relying on the fusion report, um, report uh, Chris Steele, just wasn't there. It wasn't there. So I know in the field, uh, during the church committee report, back in uh, hearings back in 1975, I was in Somalia. You know, you're so busy overseas that you don't really pay a whole lot of attention to what's happening. And that, that is Washington politics. That's a whole different separate situation. You just do your job as best you can. In Washington, it's a little harder to escape because you're, you're right there. You're reading the papers every day. And, uh, but I think in the main, people keeping their nose to the, to the grindstone. For CIA, I can't, I can't speak about 
about FBI. I know uh, James Callstrom was on Fox News yesterday. He's a former assistant director. I knew him in New York, wonderful guy. And uh, he made some not very um, complimentary remarks about his old organization. I know FBI agents in New York who are very upset with what's going on because uh, during the time I dealt with the FBI uh, twice really for quite uh, a long period of time. In the 1981s, I was chief of the Italian branch. They were trying to run operations against the mafia overseas. They needed our help and our guidance. We helped them. They were really good people and they stuck within the law. In New York, I met with them once a month for, th for three years. And uh, again, very, very, very strong, very good, very loyal people. Hi. Um, in terms of, okay, I'm sorry. In, in terms of the uh, security that you have in the major countries, there are FBI people that are in there. <coughs> There's a few, I think, CIA, I'm not sure how many, and Secret Service. Is that fairly common now or not common? <laughs> I don't know myself of any private company that has um, on duty serving FBI or CIA They're people. Not on duty, but have retired and oh, <laughs> yeah. Can, can censor, for example. Yeah, no, I think I think to the extent that uh, that companies have taken these people on, they're obviously the security is going to improve. Is is that common? Is that a common practice? <laughs> I think it's becoming more common. I think it's going to become more common since we have this rash of cyber attacks. Uh, I've attended uh, conferences in New York in the last couple of years where companies are really upset. They don't feel that they have uh, the right expertise. They don't want to rely on government either. They, it's sort of a uh, catch as catch can. Uh, they don't necessarily want to take the advice that, uh, that is being tendered, but I think that's going to change. Uh, one of the most depressing <laughs> meetings of my old career was to go out to GM uh, in 1988. GM had been heavily targeted by the French. And so I sat with all their senior leadership, and, and they said, frankly, we don't believe you. So I had to cite an example that one of their top people had gone to Paris and then flown down to Brittany in one of the French air, uh, <laughs> uh, cars, airplanes, and the fellow lost his briefcase for three days. Well, on his way back, uh, the French came to him and said, oh, we found it in the back of the airplane. <laughs> Though they understood. But I mean, it took, there was an appalling lack of sophistication, in my personal view, in the senior leadership of our largest uh, auto company. I think it's improved. I think it has. Um, that was 20 years ago. Are there more questions in the back? Okay, I'm coming back. Thank you for your comments tonight and for your years of service. Uh, just to go back to two topics that you went to, you mentioned a number of other foreign intelligence services. Could you just talk about which intelligence services, both friendly and adversary, were regarded as some of the more better ones during your course of your career? And also you mentioned things like serving on the local school board. Talk about the challenges to families who are also are involved in, you know, who have professionals and spouses working uh, in the intelligence area and the, and the strains that are on families and the things that are done to, to make better for families. Let me take the second question first. Uh, serving with a family abroad is, is the biggest challenge and possibly the biggest drawback because you have, in Somalia, for example, um, the level of schooling was not particularly high. And so I had two, I had two kids in the school. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's what, that's what you do. I mean, that was my job, and my family came. My wife came. She was a good soldier. And uh, it, it was, a, you know, interest very, for me, the most interesting of my tours because it was so different, so different from anything I had done before. I'd been in Vietnam, and I'd travel around a lot. But uh, so... The, the sacrifices that you make in terms of schooling uh, uh, can be there. On the other hand, um, in France, I had two daughters in France, 
they learned French. But I had a tough time because they were Americans, they were being picked on by the local French kids. And, um, but you know, if you can get through all that, you come out with a much more sophisticated, much more well-rounded, understanding person uh, as a result of uh, living overseas. I mean, travel, living overseas is the best education you could possibly get. And a lot of those kids uh, are now coming to work for the, for the U.S. government. We got a lot of people in CIA uh, whose parents were in CIA, so we have, a, we have an advantage of youngsters who know the foreign environment and a language without having to be taught uh, once, they, once they come on board. As to the, the first, the first uh, question, uh, France, you know, you have a liaison relationship with, with France, for example. And we exchanged information with them on the Soviet presence, Eastern European presence, uh, all the, the hard targets, the communist countries, because they had an interest in knowing uh, what was going on. At the same time, they are getting into our knickers in a big way. So you have this, you have this sort of dual relationship. You know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. They don't know necessarily that you know what they're doing. So, uh, but this came, this came evident later on. Um, but other countries, I mean, the Israelis had a, had a case, Jonathan Pollard, an NSA employee. Almost every country wants to have its American source, literally. And so you have, you have uh, I, I don't know that the Germans do, but they would certainly like to. Uh, the British, we have arrangements with many of many countries that we don't spy on each other. That's not true, and I know, and, and uh, we don't. But uh, I know that you know the British at a certain time were telling the Danes that we were spying on them. We had no unilateral operations against the Danes, and uh, I mean at that time the British were losing their empire. They were upset. Uh, they were seeing their, their flag go down, and there was a lot of resentment amongst their field officers. Understandable, I suppose, but, uh, but not right, nevertheless. I don't know if that answered your question uh, or not. But, um, so we have dual relationships with, with services, uh, really, all over the world. Uh, sir, thank you very much for your comments. What is your opinion of the uh, hollowing out of the State Department? In a serious way, starting I'm sorry, with. Sorry, uh, where are you speaking? I can't. Oh. Okay. Uh, what is your opinion of the hollowing out of the State Department in the last year? I think it's a big mistake. Uh, now, uh, when I went to Somalia, I had to resign from CIA and join State because I was totally integrated. I had to take their consular course. And I know that the State Department bureaucracy is large, unwieldy, and not necessarily always effective, but uh, the hollowing out has occurred at the officer level, and that's a big mistake. So you have, uh, you have people in charge of, uh, nobody in charge of Latin America right now. Uh, I don't know that any in Africa, I was just reading about Torsen's trip the other day, uh, there's no assistant secretary for Africa. But uh, I remind you that when Bill Clinton came in, he had no Assistant Secretary for International Organizations, which is what supports the UN. And I was, I was Chief of Station then. And Madeleine Albright comes in, and there's nobody at State to give her policy guidance. So one day at her staff meeting, she said, I called State. Nobody could give me any advice. I called the White House, and she got one of Bill Clinton's assistants who said, he was talking about Kosovo. What is Kosovo? <laughs> I kid you not. So, I mean, there are precedents for, for the kinds of personnel lapses that uh, have occurred, but I, I think it's too bad that, that Trump doesn't seem to appreciate the importance of having continuity at leadership positions uh, in the State Department. And I think that Mike Pompeo uh, will act to reverse that. We have time for one more question. Mm, who gets the last one? Ooh, she's closer. So it sounds like from a security standpoint, you're stressing really the whole technological um, issues. How, is there any link at all with what we're seeing globally as far as just political systems, um, 
nationalism, uh, what's, you know, with Brexit, um, the elections in Germany, the elections that, that, that could have played out in France, um, the election in our own country. How do you see some, some of the political candidates that we're seeing affect any of this security, or is it kind of not, there's not really a direct link? I don't think that uh, populism in Italy or uh, Austria or Poland really affects the security uh, situation. The security situation is really driven by, by uh, leaders of, uh, of Russia, China, uh, North Korea. I mean, that's where the, the threats mainly come from. But also uh, the Iranians. I mean, there are a lot of others. I don't think that the, this wave of, of populism uh, which has not seemed to have not have peaked yet, uh, is really affecting the, the security aspects. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you much. so much to David and Jerry, and thank you everyone for coming. Have a wonderful evening.